pray, saints. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The path of sin too long I tried. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have light in my soul for which long I have sought Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus 
came into my heart. I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure since Jesus came into my heart. And no dark clouds of doubt, now my pathway obscure, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I'm happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Well, sorry about that. <laughs> if you have your Bibles tonight, open with us to the book of Psalms, the 44th division of the book of Psalms. While you're opening there, I want to give you somewhat of a little history lesson, uh, something I'm sure many of you know. Uh, you know, St. Patrick's Day is a holiday that everybody celebrates with shamrocks and green and all that kind of stuff, but you find out if you study St. Patrick that he was a missionary. Uh, he was later canonized by the Catholic Church, but they're wrong. He was not Catholic. He was not Protestant because the Protestant Reformation had not yet taken place. And what you'll find if you study St. Patrick is he was probably what they later referred to as an Anabaptist. He was raised Scottish and was kidnapped and taken 200 miles inland into Ireland and was held captive there for several years where he later escaped and, and gets back out to the coast. And at that time, he had such a heart for Ireland, which at that time was a barbaric nation, that he prayed and he sought the Lord to go back into Ireland and to seek to stir and to bring revival. And so Patrick, later called St. Patrick, Brother Patrick, whose daddy was a deacon, grandfather was a preacher, goes back into Ireland and he preaches the gospel. And he seeks the king, and the king desired to kill him because he knew that he stood against everything that Ireland at that time stood for. He is able to convert the king of Ireland to Christianity, and he personally baptized the king of Ireland. It was later written that St. Patrick saved civilization on that island. And so it's a pretty incredible story when you think about it and how now we, we celebrate St. Patrick's Day. They even said one of the things, the trademarks of St. Patrick, obviously, and of course the Irish tradition is the shamrock, which is the, the, the clover leaf. And they said that he would take the three-leaf clover and would use that as a presentation of the gospel and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and after the king was saved, he baptized him. And that's why we know that he probably didn't have any ties to the Catholic Church. And before you get hung up on St. Patrick and talking about them canonizing, they also said that Peter was Catholic and Paul was Catholic and all of that. So they can be wrong if they want to. I'm not saying he was Baptist. I'm just saying he, he sure did reflect some Baptist traits in the way the Lord used him there in the early part of the first century. I mean, it's incredible, really, to study the life of St. Patrick. And so it's a lot better story than the actual legend. They said that, you know, the legend of St. Patrick is that he drove all the snakes out of Ireland. You ever heard that? That he drove all the snakes out of Ireland? A guy that I read after said, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but what he did do was drive out barbaric tendencies and drove out that, that crazy lifestyle they were living. And God used him to usher in a lifestyle of Christianity and faith. And, of course, you study Ireland, and, of course, a lot of us I know have got some Irish in us, uh, and, and you study all of that. It's kind of interesting stuff. So, anyway, I just want to throw that at you. Uh, so that's why I wear green. I'm not celebrating any pagan holiday, and I'm not going, going out to party tonight. I just, uh, 
I just thought that was pretty neat. But anyway, now I wore my green shirt before I realized all that. I read that this afternoon, but thought I'd share it with you and pretend that I knew that all along. <laughs> Psalm 44. This is a word tonight. I pray it'll be a blessing to you. I feel like it's going to be good to us if I can get it out uh, the way that I got it. We're going to read the first five verses there of the 44th Psalm. The Bible says, We've heard with our ears, O God, our fathers, have told us what work thou didst in their days and in the times of old. How thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and planted them, and how thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. For they got not in the land in possess or not got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand and thine arm and light of thy countenance, because thou hast a favor unto them. Thou art my king, O God, command deliverances for Jacob. <laughs> Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against us. I want to look at that tonight, and I, I want to bring a, just a message. It's not going to be a, a, just the most you know, powerful message you've ever heard, but I think it would be a blessing to you uh, on, on this thought of the God of every generation. The God of every generation. Let me pray real quick. Father, we love you. We thank you tonight. We get to come together and preach your word. Now, I pray you minister to our heart and help us to draw closer to you. Your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The God of every generation. When I read this, I was thinking about what he says there in verse 1. Of course, we'll look at verse 1 and verse 2. And I want you to think about this. As we talked about St. Patrick, and we talked about the, you know, the saints of God and, and, and who we are tonight in Jesus. I, I, I kind of use that as a theme throughout the message tonight, but I want you to think about this with me. Number one, the obligation of the seasoned saint. The obligation of the seasoned saint. You notice what he says there in verse, four, uh, verse 1 of, of 44 there. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work thou did in their days in the times of old. I want you to think with me about that as you consider with me the power of a testimony. As he talks about that in verse 1, you realize that what he's saying is, is what we've heard, we've heard because somebody told us. We've heard because somebody has shared with us. There is a, a great generational divide in our world tonight, in our country tonight. You know, we've got all these generations that we talk about in the country. We've got the, 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 what they call the great generation who are very fastly leaving us, and then they've got the baby boomers, uh, and then I'm not exactly sure what came right after the baby boomers, but I know they got the generation, generation X's and the Y's, and I don't know if there's a Z or not, and then they got millennials, and I don't know what they're calling the X crowd. They actually have, have recategorized my group as x -ennials, which is kind of a part millennial, part Generation X. They said that we had the ambition of the millennials, but the same critical mindset of the Generation X, which I believe that. I, I kind of criticize you know, a lot of stuff. So anyway, huh, this is what it is. But we go through and we separate everything out in generation. And, and if you're not careful, you'll miss what I'm saying tonight is our obligation as a saint, especially as a seasoned saint. One of the things that we've got in here tonight is a diversity of age group. If you look in here tonight, we've got young ones, we've got, we've got older folks, we've got men, we've got women, we've got families, we've got all the different types of people that we have in here. And I would say this, as you think about a seasoned saint, and what you would think about is somebody that's really, really got some salt in their life from walking for God and walking with God. The obligation of that seasoned saint, the obligation of that one who has lived their life. And you don't have to be old to be a seasoned saint. You can, just, you can be a young person who's lived your life for the Lord for a long time. But with that seasoning comes an obligation. And that obligation is to tell people about Jesus. That obligation is not just to tell lost people and tell other people about Jesus. But it's to tell this next generation. You've got to be careful not to condemn a generation for doing the same things you did before God found you. But we'll do that. Be careful not to, not to say, because we categorize sin and we think, well, our sin wasn't as bad as their sin because you didn't have sin like that when you were growing up, so we throw all them under the bus. But if God was God then and he's still God now, then you've got an obligation to tell them that God was able to help me through what I went through, and he's able to help you too. And the same God that helped Mama and Daddy and the same God that helped Mama and Papa and the same God that helped all of those old ones when they came through, what they've been through, all those people that worship God, that's the same God that we're worshiping in here tonight. And if that was true for the seasoned saints, for the senior saints, for the older saints, it's true for the young ones tonight too. 
And so the obligation of the seasoned saint is to understand the power of a testimony. As he said, that we heard with our ears, Oh God, our fathers have told us the work that you did in their day. That the obligation is that we testify what God did for us in our time, what God did for us in our generation, what God did for us in our family, in our situation. Well, the worst thing that we can do when we get a little bit older is think that we don't uh, have a past. <laughs> Or think that we've never done anything wrong. Or think that we never committed a sin. Just because it wasn't on Facebook doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Amen? Thank God there wasn't Facebook back in the 40s and 50s. Anybody in here? 60s. Huh? 70s. Amen? 80s and 90s. I'm going to tell you something. There's more pressure on young people now to do right and be perfect than there's ever been. And it's because I'm telling you, if everything I did when I was in high school was on Facebook, you probably wouldn't have me as your pastor tonight. I'm just being honest with you. And I wasn't even that bad of a kid. But I did some stupid stuff. And I'm glad that there's no record except in my mind, right? And in other people's minds. Of course, a lot of people I was around don't remember none of it. But anyway, <laughs> understand what I'm saying. When I say to you tonight, we have an obligation not to look at this next crowd and say that they've got to be perfect, but understanding that they'll never be perfect. And the same God that got us through our imperfection can get them through theirs. The same God that helped them can help us. The same God that blessed them can bless us. The same God that was for us is for them. And so we hope tonight that we understand the power that lies in a testimony as we can take what God's done for us and share it. Not only with people in the world tonight and lost people tonight, but we need to hear it in the church. We need to know tonight that the same God that, that was of Abraham was the God of Isaac and was the God of Israel. And that's the same God of the church tonight. And so we serve and we worship in that capacity. The focus of a testimony you also see there in verse 1 as he goes on from that and talks about what you did in those days. That the focus of the testimony should never be about what we did wrong. It should never be about what we didn't do wrong. The focus of the testimony is about what God did. And it doesn't matter if your sin was stealing a lot. There used to be a lady who worked at a store in Sibley named Sylvia. Sylvia Pennington. I'll never forget her. And Sylvia, she was Pentecostal. She had hair down to her, to her waist. And she worked in that store diligently. We had baseball practice right behind the store. And I got my new baseball cap. And when you were a kid, that was a big deal when you got your new hat for the new season. So I got my hat. We got done with practice. I walked up to the store, Hayes Grocery, right there in Sibley. I walked up there, and I didn't want to buy a marker to write my name in my hat, so I just went down the aisle and got one of the markers, wrote my name in it, put it back. Well, they had them big rounded mirrors in the corners of the store, and she saw me. So when I came out, she said, you're going to pay for that marker. I said, what marker? She said, the marker you just used. Well, you can guess what? I got in trouble for that. As simple and innocent as that was, I thought it was silly. I thought I should have been able, and they probably would have let me if I'd have asked, but I guess I stole enough ink that she thought I should be in trouble. Now, the people at the store let me go. I didn't go to jail or serve any hard time. But whether your sin was stealing a little bit of ink from a magic marker or whether you was a murderer, God's big enough to take care of all that. God's big enough to work in anybody's life. And so what he's saying is, is the focus of the testimony is never necessarily the person that's testifying. The focus of the testimony is God. And what we're trying to tell people is not that you're better than we were or that you're worse than we were, but that your problem is very universal connected to my problem, and that is that we're all sinners. So because of that, we all sin. I'd, I'd tell young people in here tonight, look at the, let the sweetest, oldest people in this room tonight and know this. And don't get mad at me, lovely senior saints. They're all sinners. Amen? And when we as the older people look at the younger people in here tonight and wonder, why in the world are they so crazy? I'll tell you why. They're sinners. Amen? They come out of the womb. It don't take long at all for you to recognize a child is a sinner. They'll make it very evident. The first word they say is no. When you know they did it. You walk in a room with Kool-Aid all over the floor. Did you do it? No. I didn't do it. Making messes, turning over stuff. I was telling David them the other day about uh, one of mine, when he was six months old, would come up and knock tea over in front of me just to see what I'd do. I'd be telling him, no. i pop his hand. <laughs> knock that tea over and look at me just like, what you going to do about it, big boy? When six months old, you can't do much. You go to jail, right? <laughs> but when they're six years old, <laughs> all right, amen. Anybody in here tonight? So anyway... <laughs> the power of a testimony, the focus of a testimony, is us recognizing that God is the hero. He's the one. If there's any good in the room tonight, anybody in here has ever had anything right come out of your life, it's because of God, whether you're willing to admit it or not. 
So you can talk about your skills and your wisdom and all the stuff that you've achieved and all the stuff you've accomplished. You ain't nothing. Amen? It's what the Lord's done for you. And the Lord's blessed you. And the Lord has been favorable in your life. The power of a testimony, the focus of a testimony, and the truth of a testimony you see in verse 2. How you drove out the heathen uh, with your hand and how you planted them and how you did afflict the people and cast them out. Now he's talking about the promise of the land and he's talking about how God went before them and he removed the people that were in the land to contaminate the promise of God. In our application, you could say of all the things that God has done, it's taken away the sin. God's taken away the influences. God's taken the people that you used to look up to. You remember when you were a kid? This is one of the most, I guess, sobering things as a kid when you grow up. I think every kid, or at least the little boys especially, you had that one guy, whoever he was. Maybe it was a father figure or maybe it was your father. Maybe it was a ball coach or something like that that you looked up to and you looked up to them because they were bad. You thought they were cool because of their lifestyle and you thought because it was a lifestyle you weren't allowed to live, you kind of looked up to that. And you thought that was something. But then you lived a little bit, you grew up a little bit, and you found out that what you had one time idolized, you grew long enough to realize that that was bad. And it wasn't no good ever going to come out of that. And that's a blessing when you get to that place in your life. See, the truth of a testimony is, is realizing that God has to take those influence out of our lives. God has to take, there were things that used to tempt you. There are believers in here tonight, you could testify if we'd open the floor. There were things that used to have a halt on you. There were things in your life that had a grip in your life that pulled you like a bug to a lamp at night. You remember them old lamps used to hang up? You'd hear them bugs fry. Pssst. Remember that? I don't know if they still have them or not, if that's politically correct. Probably not. You're probably supposed to go out and counsel with the bugs and ask them to go to your neighbor's house now. Invite them in for supper, you know, and, 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 and a long nap, right? <laughs> but we used to electrocute them, <laughs> amen, and sweep them up in the morning time. But I, you remember that? They, they couldn't help it. No matter, you think they'd know better, but they'd go right to that light, pfft, hit the floor. There were things in your life that had that kind of power over you. Even though you knew it was wrong, you couldn't turn loose of it. And the reason you're free from it tonight is because of the power of God. That's the testimony I'm talking about. The obligation of a seasoned saint is to testify and to tell these younger people. And, to tell the, and when we say younger people, I'm not talking about going finding strangers and telling them. Tell your people. Tell your kids. If we all told our kids and our grandkids what we're supposed to tell everybody, they'd all get told. Amen? Love them. Help them. Tell them. Let them see I'm not perfect. I never was perfect, but I serve a perfect God. He saved me from my sin. He can save you from your sin. He freed me from my temptation. He can free you from yours. I used to be like the, the, the bug in the light, but God broke that influence. God took away that draw, and I was able to turn that affection towards him. The obligation of a seasoned saint, verse 1 and verse 2, the victory of all saints in verse 3 and verse 4. He goes on now in verse 3 and verse 4 and says, For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did they do this or save themselves by their own arm. But he said, It's by your right hand. Where victory is not. Victory is not in your effort. Victory is not in your power. Victory is not in your will. Victory is in your surrender. Victory is not in us stepping up, pulling up by the bootstraps, getting motivated and getting at, you know, up and, 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 and whatever the case may be, just driving forward for the glory of God. The best thing you can ever do is get to the end of yourself and get on your knees and surrender. I love the quote we used at Vance Havner several weeks ago. It said the only area in life that, that surrender means victory is in the Christian faith. That we can surrender. In any other aspect, you surrender, you lose. You wave the white flag, you lose. But you wave the white flag in your relationship with the Lord, you're handing the reins over to Him. You're just getting to the edge of victory. You're just getting to the place that God can use you, where God can bless you, where God can have His way with you. And that's what we're talking about tonight. This, this, this thought of the God of all generations means that uh, the, the peace that I have in my heart tonight, even though I, I hear about the, the chaos that's going on. Have you ever heard anything as confusing as our country and our government? Isn't it just silly? And it don't matter which side you're on or what side you're for. You've got one side wants to build a wall, so they say build the wall. The other side don't build the wall. So we declare emergency. We're going to build the wall. Well, they, they put up whatever the thing they voted in to resist it. They're not going to have no wall. Well, he vetoes the action that they said you can't build the wall. says we've got to build the wall. I don't know what we're going to do, but I know this. God's still God. And if they build the wall, if they don't build the wall, if they cut Mexico off and we turn into two continents, whatever. Or if they throw the gate open, we all become one big country. I don't know. I like their food. Amen. Well, what, I don't know what the case is. <laughs> Tex-Mex, it'd just be Mex then, I guess. Or Tex, I don't know what it would be. I'm just saying to you tonight, we get so bound up in this stuff, this temporal stuff, and this political stuff, and all of this silly stuff, 
And they'll be arguing about it. You mock my word. If they build the wall, somebody's going to come in and tear it down. You watch. It'll be one of the biggest wastes of my, I don't know. I'm, I say I'm for it. I'm for, I'm for protecting our borders, but I don't think it'll be permanent. I don't know why, but I don't think it'll be permanent. I think, so, I think that'll be one of the big moves they do as soon as they get in, is they'll come in. You can, they got the one now. They call him Vanilla Obama. What's his name? Beatty Rourke. Bo, Beatty, Betty Rourke. I call him Be, Beto. I, I don't know what they're going to do. Anyway, I'm sorry I said Vanilla Obama. I like vanilla. Lord. Where victory is, in verse 3, he said, For they, <laughs> they got not the land because of their possession by their own sword. What he's saying is they didn't get their victory because of them. They got their victory because of Jesus. You didn't get what you've got tonight because of him. You got it because of you. I mean, because of him. You got it not because of you, but because of him. Because of what the Lord's done for you. And you find out who that victory is in verse 4. He says, You're my king. He's asking him to command deliverances of Jacob. That Jacob, there's Israel. He's talking about the people of God. He's talking about being delivered from a hindrance to the promise of God and doing what God's called us to do and being what God's called us to be so that we can press forward for the glory of God, the obligation of the seasoned saint, verse 1 and verse 2, the victory of all saints in verse 3 and verse 4 and in verse 5, you see the key to victory for every saint. You go on from there and he says in verse 5, through thee will we push down our enemies. We thought about Elijah this morning and what he was able to do. What he did, he did in the name of the Lord. The Bible said when he built that altar to call down that fire and lay that sacrifice, that he built that altar in the name of the Lord. That his desire was to see God glorified and to see God magnified. And when he did what he did, he did it in the name of the Lord. Now the only way we can know tonight and the key for us to have victory in our life and everything that we do is to do it in the name of the Lord. And the only way I can do that is to surrender myself and to die myself and to give myself up and come into the presence of God and let God have his way in my heart and in my life. That's the only way we can have victory in our church tonight is to set our agenda aside and not fuss and be uh, cantankerous or think that we've got a will or an agenda or that God is going to bless a mess because that's not going to happen. We've got to get out of the way and we've got to let God have the reins and let God do what he's going to do. Let God be God and every man a liar. Give it over to him and understand then that the only way we can have deliverance and the only way we can be delivered is through the king. Verse 5, he says that we're going to push down our enemies because of you. Through you, we're going to push down our enemies. Our responsibility, you're finding that word push. That means we can't just sit here and wait on God to whoop them. Right? We can't just wait. Y'all heard the joke before about the guy that broke in the house at night and the parrot was sitting in the parrot cage and the, and the parrot kept telling the criminal, Jesus is going to get you. And he walked around, and finally he looked at the parrot and said, Well, you shut up. He said, Jesus is going to get you. He shined a light, and there was a big old 75-pound Doberman pincher. He shined a light on him, and the parrot said, Get him, Jesus. Right? <laughs> we can sit here all day long and say, Go get him, God. We sit here all day long and say, God, bring victory. But what he says there and, and, and what he implies is there, we got to push. We've got to fight back. We've got to be willing to get up. Yes, God could have sent fire without Elijah. God could have sent fire without anything he did. God could have done anything he wanted to do. God can do anything he wants to tonight. God can speak without me preaching tonight, but that's not the way he chooses to do it. God's called us to keep pushing. And so we keep pushing. We keep pressing forward. We keep taking what God's given us and going with it, pressing forward to do the things that God has called us to do. And so the key to victory tonight is understanding that our victory is through him, but we get victory through him by not giving up, by not quitting, by pushing. By fighting, by standing, by going, by testifying, by looking around in here tonight and realizing that we strengthen one another and we help one another and we minister to one another and we build up one another so that we can be a better church. We all want to be a shining star. We all want the little badge on our chest that says we're the best or that we're the brightest. But the fact of the matter is we come along together or we don't come along. And so we help one another. We undergird each other with strength. And when this one's down, we help that one. And when that one's down, we help that one because we know at one point or another, you're going to be the one that's down. I'm going to be the one that's down. We've said several times on Wednesday night, the reason we pray over our prayer list, the back of that prayer list, I know it gets kind of monotonous when we read all those names because it's hundreds of them. We come in here on Wednesday night, we read every one of those names on that prayer list out loud. And the reason we do is because we tell people we will. As we tell them, if you tell us what you want us to pray for, we'll call you out on Wednesday night and we'll pray for you. And we're going to do that. We come in here and we pray for those people. We call them by name and we pray for them before the Lord. And we say several Wednesday nights, the reason we pray for all these people and the reason we do so fervently is because one day it's going to be us on the prayer list. 
Listen, everybody in this room tonight is going to end up on this prayer list. <laughs> That's hard to believe, but you're going to end up on here at some point. And if not you, your family. <laughs> and so we're going to pray that it's you first, right? And that, and that we can pray you through something. But if not, it's going to be the you family. And we're going to be praying for your family. Nonetheless, because of you, there's going to be a spot filled on this prayer list. Because of everybody in this room tonight. That's why we pray. That's why we help each other. The key to victory is understanding that anything that we do that's right is going to be through him. But in doing it, we've got to keep pushing. We've got to do our part. That's what he says in verse 5. Through thee, we will push down our enemies. Through thy name, we will tread them under that rise up against us. Victory through his name. That we go do what we do in the name of the Lord. That we stand in the name of the Lord. We kneel in the name of the Lord. We serve in the name of the Lord. We testify in the name of the Lord. We preach, we sing, we minister, we go in the name of the Lord. We support missions in the name of the Lord. That what we do tonight, we're here to exalt. And that word exalt means to forcefully and purposefully lift the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Remember when you was a kid? Oh, you might not remember. Some of y'all probably don't remember when you was a kid. But uh, you've seen kids, or maybe you remember, when your daddy would get you and throw you up in the air and catch you, the higher the better, right? It took force and it took purpose. But daddy throw you up and right at the tip top, you start wondering if this is too high or not, right? You see that kid, you know, it's fun for about two or three feet, but the further they get from daddy's hands, the scarier it gets, right? When we talk about exalting the name of the Lord, that's what I'm talking about. Getting underneath the name of God and pushing and magnifying, and with great purpose and with great force, doing everything we can. Like Elijah said, Elijah's prayer this morning was so that people could know that there's a God in heaven. And that's our job. That's our detail. The God of every generation. The obligation of the senior saint, the obligation of the seasoned saint, whether it's senior or not, the obligation of the seasoned saint is to tell the people that God is still God who always was God. And there's nothing you're going to stumble into that he can't get you out of and I know that because he got me out of everything that I stumbled into. And so we know that God's able. We have a responsibility to do that. The victory that we have for the saints is that we continue to do what God's called us to do. And we do it God's way. And that our victory is not in our strength, not in our arm, not in our stand, but it's in his. And so we give God all the glory and understand that the key to it is that we don't give up. We magnify the name of the Lord. We keep pushing for the glory of God. And we trust that he's going to do what he said he would do. And that's bring deliverance to Jacob. In their, in their reference and in that, in that context, he's talking about to the promise of God. Being faithful to the promise of Jacob. To us, we could say being faithful to the promise of the church, which is the promise of the word of God, which is salvation. To all those who come by faith, repenting and trusting in Christ. So we go out and preach the gospel. We don't give up. We don't back up because we know that God's able. Because he is not just the God of one generation. He's not just the God of yesteryear. He's the God, same today and tomorrow, Jesus Christ. So he's the Lord. Amen. Stand with me. Father, we love you. Thank you tonight for this word, and I pray that it be an encouragement to us as we go out of this place to be a blessing. Father, we thank you tonight for your presence in this day. Thank you for all you've done for us, and now as we open an altar and give an invitation, I pray if there's one here tonight that's struggling with just being able to trust you and know, God, that the same God that was yesterday is today. And that just as faithful as you were to your people then, you'll be just as faithful to us tonight. If there's somebody here tonight that needs to come to this altar and ask you just to help them, just to trust in your faithfulness and know that you're able, I pray you'd give them the grace to come tonight. And as always, we pray if there's one here that needs to be saved, I pray, God, you'd save them right here on a Sunday night. Your will be done. We're going to thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.